So what are we doing? You said, I need help with Bergson. I don't know Sorrel meaningfully at all. Uh, I think at all would be fine. So uh, I'm to say like that's... meaningfully is not even an accurate way to put it. Uh, well, that's totally fine because neither do I. Uh, I just rec I just noticed that there's oh he he uses Bergson here in like a couple of a couple of subsequent pages, so oh, I no. figured I'd make you suffer. You can go through it with me, and <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe you'll have something more interesting to say than I do. Hopefully. Okay. Fair I'm enough. basically I'm basically just outsourcing uh, labor in a labor free job. Well, here's hoping I can help. Um, yeah, so uh, I think this chapter starts on 109, and it goes to farther than we're going to go. I think we're probably going to go to uh, the end of section 1, because I think that's where the references stop. So I'll just start yeah. reading, and if you have anything you'd like to say uh, or like comment on, it's like critiquing. No, I'm happy to take Sorrel or off. me. <laughs> happy to take weight off your voice and read a little bit myself too. So I'm around. I appreciate it. All right. <coughs> I spoke too soon. I feel like feel like shit now. All of a sudden. Good. Here we go. This is uh, Sorrel's Georges Sorrel's uh, reflections on violence, chapter four, the proletarian strike. And just a heads up, Rex. I am hearing myself a little bit in your headset again. God damn it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I know. It's because it's a long story. I, 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 have to, I, can, I had to reformat my entire computer because I lost a hard drive. And so I had all of my little settings and filters and everything just perfect. And it's all fucking gone. See, that's, so, how, you don't, that's how you don't get your horse folders uh, exposed to stream. Uh, let's just run with it. Worst case scenario, this is nerd shit anyways. It's, they'll, they'll bear it. No one cares. <clears throat> no one cares. Everyone's slowly tuning out to go watch something slightly more interesting. Exactly. Chapter 4 of Reflections on Violence by Joseph Sorrell, The Proletarian Strike. 1. The confusion of parliamentary socialism and the clarity of the general strike. Myths in history, that's a table of contents. We're not going to bother with that. Okay, section 1. Every time that we attempt uh, to obtain an exact conception of the idea behind proletarian violence, uh, we are forced to go back to the notion of the general strike, but the same notion may provide many other services and throw an unexpected light on all the other obscure parts of socialism. In the last pages of the first chapter, I compared the general strike to the Napoleonic battle which definitively crushes an adversary. This comparison will help us to understand the ideological role of the general strike. When today's military writers discuss the new methods of war necessitated by the employment of troops infinitely more numerous than those of Napoleon and equipped with weapons much more deadly than those of the time, they nevertheless imagine that wars will be decided in Napoleonic battles. The new tactics uh, must fit into the drama Napoleon had conceived. No doubt the detailed development of the combat will be quite different from what it used to be, but at the end must always be the catastrophic defeat of the enemy. The methods of military instruction are intended to prepare the soldier for this great and terrible action in which everybody must be prepared to take part at the first signal. From the highest to the lowest, the members of a really solid army always have in mind this catastrophic outcome of international conflicts. The revolutionary syndicates, they pronounce that syndicates? The revolutionary... Uh, Sounds like a Saturday morning cartoon. <laughs> syndicate. <laughs> that'd, be a, that'd be a great podcast name, actually. Um, the revolutionary syndicates argue about socialist action in exactly the same way as the military writers argue about war. They enclose the whole of socialism in the general strike. <clears throat> they look upon every combination as one that should culminate in this fact. They see in each strike a model, a test, a preparation for the great final upheaval. The new school, which calls itself Marxist, syndicalist, and revolutionary, declared in favor of the idea of the general strike as soon as it became clearly conscious of the true sense of its own doctrine, of the consequences of its activity and of its own originality. It was thus led to break with the old official, utopian, and political coteries that held the general strike in horror and in stark contrast to launch itself into the true movement of the revolutionary proletariat, which for a long time had made adherence to the general strike, the test, by means of which the socialism of the workers was distinguished from that of the amateur revolutionaries. What is he trying to say so far? Uh, uh, um, there has been a uh, woeful tendency 
of Marxists uh, who are strategizing revolutionary action to conceive of it in terms of conventional warfare with a clear-cut defeat of the enemy as a consequence of superior tactics or whatever, something like that. Winning in one's fell swoop instead of smaller actions or... That's what I'm. That's what I'm taking away from it. Um, I think like who comes to mind would be um like sort of the Bolshevik approach, um st 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 stuff like that. Uh, parliamentary socialists can only have a great influence if, through the use of a very confused language, they can impose themselves on very diverse groups. They must have working class constituents simple enough to allow themselves to be duped by high sounding phrases about the future collectivism. They are compelled to represent themselves as profound philosophers to stupid members of the bourgeoisie who wish to appear well-informed about social questions. It is very necessary for them to be able to exploit rich people who think that they are earning the gratitude of humanity by taking shares in the enterprises of, so of political socialism. Sorrel, I'm sorry, you are not entertaining, Brooks. <clears throat> this influence is founded upon gibberish and our... Don't get tea. Don't be a dick. <laughs> okay. I didn't realize you could hear me, actually. This influence is founded upon, although that explains now why I'm hearing an echo. This influence. No, is, I term, that does not. Well, how did you hear me? Because I muted the microphone, which automatically turns on my monitors. But well, you took your headset off. Yeah, I had the monitors playing because I had muted my mic. Oh, I see. Okay. It's all coming together. God damn it. <clears throat> this influence is founded upon gibberish, and our great men endeavor, sometimes only too successfully, to spread confusion among the ideas of their readers. They detest the general strike because all the propaganda surrounding it is too socialist, too socialistic to please philanthropists. <sighs> We're almost there. I kind of like this so far. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually pretty good. Um, in the mouths of these would-be representatives of the proletariat, all socialist formulas lose their real sense. Just real quick, if yeah. there's a handful of sentences I think worth going over. Yeah. I kind of just like the sentiment of them. I'm not sure where he's going. God, please don't be some kind of Nazi. Um, I like this. I like this influence is founded upon gibberish. The, the line he's got right there. Um, and our great men endeavor, sometimes only too successfully, to spread confusion amongst the ideas of their readers. They detest the general strike because all the propaganda surrounding it is too socialistic to please philanthropists. There's a a play that's generally made very often. I think again, you got to think about the time he's writing this, which uh, if uh, is Mark's time, like this is like Mark's time, is this when mm. the guy's writing this? Um, you you have uh, people who are like lefties. It's probably not actually drastically different than it is today or any other time, uh, who can't really advocate for a specific position because the place they're doing it or the people they're doing it with or their or sort of surrounding support structure uh fights it or is against it. it's too socialistic uh the idea of the general strike it's almost too much it's too offensive it's too much action uh it's so it's a really interesting sort of sentiment he's pulling out from there well what he what he seems to have moved from is like there's there's the the simplistic attitude. We'll, we'll say that these are like the uh, the Haas from infrared type of like that's that's sort of a parody of that. The idea of like oh we just have the we have the violent the violent action that destroys the faction of the bourgeoisie or whatever, and that's the revolution. And then from there is a reaction to that, which is well no that's stupid. You need to have like a more nuanced, careful approach. And this this is where you get kind of like the sock dem types, where it's literally just uh, liberalism. Parliamentary with kind socialists. Of a, yeah, liberalism with a kind of a, a socialisty glazing. Yeah, and I think the line it, uh, they can only have great influence if through the use of very confused language they yeah. can impose themselves on diverse groups. <clears throat> they must have working class constituents simple enough to allow themselves to be duped by high sounding phrases such as the future collectivism. They're compelled to represent themselves as profound philosophers to stupid members of the bourgeois who wish to appear well informed. I actually this is a, it's not a bad critique so far. No, uh, it hits it hits home today too much. Um, in the mouths of these would-be representatives of the proletariat, all socialist formulas lose their real sense. The class struggle still remains the great principle, but it must be subordinated to national solidarity. Internationalism is an article of faith about which the most moderate declare themselves ready to take the most solemn oaths, but patriotism also imposes sacred duties. 
The emancipation of the workers must be the work of the workers themselves, as our newspapers tell us every day. But real emancipation consists in voting for a professional politician and securing him and securing for him the means of obtaining a comfortable situation and subjecting oneself to a leader. Vosh. In the end, the state must disappear, and they are very careful not to dispute what Engels has written on the subject. But this disappearance will take place only in a future so far distant that one must prepare oneself for it by using the state. Meanwhile, as a means of allowing politicians to gorge themselves. Um, and the best means of bringing about the disappearance of the state consists in strengthening temporarily the governmental machine. Gribuil. That's a hell of a name. Gribuil. I don't know how to pronounce that. Who threw himself into the water in order to escape getting wet in the rain would not have reasoned otherwise. And so on and so on. That is such a good line. Threw himself into the water to escape getting wet in the rain. Um, I'm going to make that the title of my next stream. Oop. I want to know what he's referring to. Uh, let's find out. Grib -ouille. It sounds like a novel. Grib -ouille, I would assume. Something like that. Um. Uh, jump into water to avoid getting wet in the so, rain. See that that's one that would like uh that's one that would do with uh with a footnote. I don't know why there is It's one. French for naive and foolishly happy people likely to throw themselves into a river to keep from getting wet in the rain. Uh being the Oh my god, like it, it naive, silly, happy people. Tiny <clears throat> happy people, I think would be another way to put it. Whole pages could be filled with the outlines of the contradictory, comical, and quack arguments which form the substance of the harangues of our great men. Nothing embarrasses them, and they know how to combine in pompous, impetuous, and nebulous speeches the most absolute intransigence with the most supple opportunism. A learned exponent of socialism has maintained that the art of reconciling opposites by means of nonsense is the most obvious result of his study of the works of Marx. Um... I confess, actually, I kind of want to read this footnote. Uh, two motions have been discussed at length by the National Council when proposing that departmental federation should be invited to enter the electoral struggle wherever it was possible. The other, that candidates should be put forward everywhere. One member got up and said, I should be glad of your earnest attention for the argument which I'm about to state may at first uh, sight appear strange and paradoxical. These two motions are not irreconcilable. If we try to solve the contradiction, according to the natural Marxist method of resolving all contradiction. It seems that nobody understood, and in fact, it was unintelligible. Um, I confess my extreme incompetence in these difficult matters. Moreover, I make no claim whatever to be counted among the people upon whom politicians confer the title of learned. Yet, I cannot easily bring myself to admit that this is the sum and substance of Marxist philosophy. I can't, even, I can't even parse this at this point. So, uh, well, this is this is like this is like a period thing. Um, but I think what he's generally talking about is there's a tendency to, uh, for like Marxist lingo, I guess, to sort of take the place of actually like providing like some kind of sound reasoning, and so just like totally like inane and and, and contradictory statements will be put forward and applauded as if like these are like serious policy or, or action proposals that will lead to socialism when in fact literally it's just abortive like nonsense um which i mean to be fair we've kind of seen a lot of the controversy between juarez and Clem that's how you pronounce that right Juar juarez between no no juarez no, that's, that's that's how you pronounce it in spanish and i have a feeling he's not saying it in spanish jore jore in Clemen clemencho uh maybe while I look it up, I have no idea who the fuck these people are. The controversy. And I anglicize. It's just easier, by the way, with French. Anglicize it. It angers French people, but everyone's okay with that, even the French, because they like being angered by people in the West. It makes them feel good. All right. As you wish. The controversy between Jars and, and Clemenco demonstrates Juarez, quite... Juarez. 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 The controversy between Juarez and Clemenceau demonstrates quite incontestably that our parliamentary socialists can succeed in imposing themselves upon the public only through their gibberish, and that as a result of continually deceiving their readers, they have finally lost all sense of honest discussion. In Le Aurore, 
of the 4th of September 1905, Clemenceau accuses Juarez of muddling the minds of his supporters, quote, with metaphysical subtleties into which they are incapable of following him, unquote. There is nothing to object to in this accusation save the use of the word metaphysical. Juarez is no more a metaphysician than he is a lawyer or an astronomer. I have a suspicion he was actually a lawyer. Uh, Juarez... <laughs> Uh, in the issue of 26 uh, of October, Clemenceau proves that his opponent possesses, quote, the art of falsifying his texts, unquote, and he ends by saying, quote, it seemed to me instructive to expose certain polemical practices, which we wrongly suppose to be the monopoly of the Jesuits, unquote. Against this noisy, garrulous, and lying socialism, which is exploited by ambitious people of every description, which amuses a few buffoons and is admired by decadence, stands revolutionary syndicalism, which endeavors, on the contrary, to leave nothing in a state of indecision. Its ideas are honestly expressed without trickery and without insinuation. No attempt is made to dilute doctrines by a stream of confused commentaries. Syndicalism strives to employ methods of expression which throw a full light on things, which put them exactly in the place assigned to them by their nature, and which bring out the whole value of the forces in play. Opposition, instead of being glossed over, must be thrown into sharp relief if we are to follow syndicalist thinking. The groups that are struggling against each other must be shown to be as separate as possible. Finally, the movements of the revolting masses are presented so as to make a deep and lasting impression on the souls of the rebels. Alright, it's better be impressive. Ooh. Here we go. No, just I'm just saying, like, yeah, yeah. He had me. He uh, had me until that point. Now I'm like, ugh. No, uh, dude, it's worth taking a second. Like, just reading through this shit is yeah. pointless. Um. Okay. Previous thing, he's going through. He's talking, and uh, he's talking about how these sort of uh, ostensibly Marxist people who utilize texts and yeah. utilize theory in order to seem very, very smart. Uh, kind of fuck up the whole entire thing, which I'm. Uh, I I I'm. I think what we need is to actually see like what specifically Juarez. the examples he's using are saying. So like Juarez, I need to see exactly what he was saying that was quote unquote metaphysical nonsense. Um, well, so Jean 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 Juarez 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 whatever. Um. Uh. Whatever that is, uh, active, massive socialist, anti-militarist. Uh, Clemenceau, Clemenceau, um, actually know terribly much about his background except that he is just generally reviled by a bunch of people I like. So that's kind of the only thing I know uh -huh. of, of that. Um, but I don't, I don't know. They, it's the last line there. Like, just I think we might be able to even break down by sort of working backwards. It seemed to me the instructive to expose certain polemical practices, which we wrongly supposed to be a monopoly of the Jesuits. Jesuits, especially at the time, but I think, you know, continuing up through probably, you know, 1950s and 60s, um, were very big on this sort of apologetics, utilizing uh, smart language around God or, or duty or nation yeah. in order to sort of drive their power. And he's basically saying um, these polemics we thought were only for those the Jesuits, but it turns out we have people in our midst doing it as well, which is what he's accusing, accusing Juarez of doing, it seems. Which I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with any of these people's writings, but um, you do see like a usage of not just not theory per se, but like terms of art from theory to sort of like bridge over ideas that don't actually have like a clear, they don't clearly follow from each other. And it seems like that's the accusation, which is sort of where like this metaphysical language is coming from. But I don't, I don't have like an example of this before me. So I can't say if that's like, this is like pure anti-intellectualism or if he's like actually going after like sophistry. So it's, um, although I think it's a Clemenceau uh, and Jaure. Jaure. And he's going to, Jaure. He's going to go into like the use of ordinary Super language. French. So. Jare. Jare. Thank you, Gabriel. Jare. He's about to go into like uh, the use of language itself. So we might actually figure it out through this. Oh, God. Okay. 
ordinary language could not produce these results in very in any very certain manner. Appeal must be made to collections of images, which taken together and through intuition alone, before any considered analyses are made, are capable of evoking the mass of sentiments which correspond to the different manifestations of the war undertaken by socialism against modern society. The syndicalists solve this problem perfectly by concentrating the whole of socialism in the drama of the general strike. What translation do you have of this? Uh, I'm using the Cambridge. Interesting. I'm using uh, Jeremy Jennings. Uh, Slightly different there, we'll just say. Who's the translator for this one? Cambridge. Um, no, this is also Jeremy Jennings. Uh, well, that is... Uh, did you skip notes? Uh, did you skip lines? Reread that section. Feels like you skipped parts. Ordinary language could not produce these results in any very certain manner. Appeal must be made to collections of images which, taken together and through intuition alone, before any considered analyses are made, are capable of evoking the mass of sentiments which correspond to the different manifestations of the war undertaken by socialism against modern society. This is where he's going to talk about Bergson. Yes. Um, the Fuck. syndicalists... Yeah. The syndicalists solve this problem... We can already see like with the image language. The syndicalists solve this no, problem... No, intuition. Intuition's also Kantian, though. You can talk about intuition and no. Kantian. No. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Not like not like this. Not like I already know what he's doing. Okay. Has to be. <sighs> but but wait, hang on, hang on. Bergson uses intuition in a Kantian sense, though. Yes, but he uses it as a methodology. <sighs> he has a methodology around intuition. Like Can you grab me some water. Thank you. I need to, I need to calm myself. <sighs> um That was a joke. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cool and collected right now. Everything's fine. The syndicalists solve this problem perfectly by concentrating the whole of socialism in the drama of the general strike. There is thus no longer any place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. For the reconciliation of opposites through the nonsense of official thinkers. Everything is clearly mapped out so that only one interpretation of socialism is possible. This method has all the advantages of that integral, sorry, all the advantages that integral knowledge has. Integral. Inte thank you. This method has all the advantages that integral knowledge has over analyses, analysis, according to the doctrine of Bergson. And perhaps it might be possible to cite many other examples which would demonstrate equally well the worth of the famous professor's doctrines. Uh, okay. So I guess we're gonna get we're gonna get uh, an analysis. We're technically already there. Yeah. So um, there's gonna be a lot that it, I think he's gonna be doing a lot, which is gonna be interesting. And I'm not sure. I'm just gonna be very upfront. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm gonna be skilled enough in Bergson, especially contemporaneous, especially uh, given that this is a French guy at the time of Bergson who yeah. probably actually listened to Bergson talk. I may not be able to know every reference or edge or have the ability to really <clears throat> talk about this at depth. I will help steer us and we'll explore this together, but I'm just letting you know. Uh, yep. Yeah, that is totally fair. Um, cause we can just like literally go through that footnote and talk about that sort of opening, but we, what keep would be, too. what would be interesting to see is if, uh, Bergson ever acknowledges Sorel. Um, uh, somebody in chat wants to try and find that. That'd be really cool. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, Please. Yeah, it's it's. We know that Sorrel. Um, Sorrel. Uh, saw Sorrel. We know that he literally watched Bergson. We know he was a huge fan. But like, I don't think it went the other way. It was unrequited. <clears throat> you might say. I'm just curious if there's any commentary at all. Like, like even, even like, uh, I doubt, I doubt Bergson really wasn't the type to do that anyway. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Sorrel mentions him a great deal. I was going through a handful of, of online notes and it's in multiple texts, multiple things, letters to people. It's kind of crazy how much he talked about Bergson. Um, and on the flip side, just to speak to what you were talking about, how Bergson wasn't the type I'm reading a whole book right now on a debate 
between Bergson and Einstein. And I'm 100 pages in. And so far, the, the actual correspondence between Bergson and Einstein is like a couple sentences. Like, just... just. Well, I mean, Bergson wrote an entire book about it. Oh, he did. Dedicated... But, like, but, like, that that was, like, that was an event, the fact that he did that, right? Well, the, let's let's go through this paragraph, because I like this paragraph. Okay. Um, and I think there's things in here that we can start sort of teasing at, and I'm hoping that he... Has, he doesn't mention Bergson again for a little bit, but that's okay. We'll get back to it. Every every page going forward for the rest of the section, actually, I think. Yeah, well, well, not the next couple of paragraphs, so it's going to be a bit of a diversion. But the the argument he's core making at this point, it seems to be, is um, the conception of the socialist utopia is laid out in advance, and so therefore, by the, by the those are in power. The syndicalists solved this by concentrating it uh, in the general strike as a sort of uh, separation. But the idea oh. is, as I'm reading it, everything is clearly mapped out, so only one interpretation of socialism is possible. This, this challenge he's sort of addressing is sort of the nature of goals as a thing. Bergson writes about this as, an, as a way, the way ideas pass into us, the way we have um, ideas that sort of are given to us, you might say socially or pre-existing and how we take those in and how we make them individuated and how we sort of turn them into ours. Um, this setup could be referring to that. I mean, it's, it's in line with it ideologically. Well, here's sort of, um, here's sort of my read on it. Um, so Bergson uh, talks about our, our location in the world and sort of the world we occupy it as we understand it as like a relationship of, of, of images. That's the specific language that he uses. Like you'll refer to the, the self as an image, the stuff around you as an image. Um, you, you the, 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 the things that are presented to you as specific images are presented as such because it's sort of like in Gibsonian language. It's like this is a, this is what Gibson would call like an affordance. This is a thing you can act upon. These represent like possibilities in the world. That, that sort of makes up sort of like a, a, the pictorial of like your universe or whatever. Um, and it seems like the, the move that he's making here is he's saying that the way uh, socialism via syndicalism wins is sort of by by way of establishing that. It's not so much that um, there's like an official plan and like people like like highfalutin thinkers have sort of like squared the circle and made socialism uh, brute forced, have managed to brute force socialism onto current conditions uh, via policy or whatever. It's literally that by locating the revolution in sort of the spontaneous action of the general strike, literally just like, like the, the spontaneous um, action of, of like the entire working class or something. Uh, like there, there, one, one world is essentially eaten up by another one. And so like a different set, a different sort of like image ensemble takes its place. And that's how you get that. Like you, you've changed the ecosystem, so to speak. Am, am, I, am I off base there or... So sort of. not wildly enough to sort of comment on. Um, I mean, there's there's little things where I'm, I would wonder if I, Bergson wouldn't say necessarily that we are sort of made up of images or that we're seeing images. There's there's a the inner sort of uh, the true self as he talks about it in matter of memory versus the um, sort of quantitative externalized social self that we sort of talk about. He may refer to one of those, but there's not like a version that mm -hmm. we are like, so there's, I probably, there's more to it than that. But again, um, like the, the self that is that the imminent, the one experiencing things, the one that's taking it in versus the projected image based ones that's ultimately partial at any time. It's never really whole. It's never really complete. Um, well, in the yeah. case of in the case of a social movement where you're locating it in that right, then you would you would be operating at that level of just like the hollowed out image by itself because you're you're you are literally dealing with like the way in which an agent without a true self, so to speak, like taking like the general strike as the the thing that's sort of like I guess experiencing an act. Yeah, in the but world. The, the way he the uh, way he words this, so he talks about um, um, this method has all the advantages that integral. I'd want to see the original French for this one. Integral knowledge has over analysis. I'm assuming he means sort of um, imminent direct knowledge. Um, 
the advantages of directly experiencing a thing has over analysis, the secondary sort of thought process that sort of uh, goes over things. Um, that this is intuition. This is what this is what uh, he's talking about ultimately. Um, so the yeah, I'd be I'd be I've got questions. Okay, we'll we'll press on for now. Um, the possibility of the actual realization of the general strike has been much discussed. It has been stated that the socialist war could not be decided in one single battle. To the practical and scientific wise men, it seems the difficulty of setting the great mass of the proletariat in motion at the time would be prodigious. The difficulties of detail which such an enormous struggle would, rep would present have been analyzed. It is the opinion of, of the socialist sociologists, as also the politicians, that the general strike is a popular dream characteristic of the beginnings of the working class movement. Cited is the authority of Sidney Webb, who has decreed that the general strike is an illusion of youth, of which the English workers, whom the practitioners of serious science have so often presented to us as the depositories of the true conception of the working class movement, soon rid themselves. That the general strike is not popular in contemporary England is a poor argument to bring against the historical significance of the idea, for the English are distinguished by an extraordinary lack of understanding of the class struggle. <clears throat> Their ideas have remained very much dominated by medieval influences. The guild, privileged or at least protected by the law, still seems to them the ideal of working class organization. It is for England that the term working class aristocracy as a name for the trade unionists was invented. And as a matter of fact, trade unionism pursues the acquisition of legal privileges. We might therefore say that the aversion felt by England for the general strike should be looked upon as strong presumptive evidence in favor of the latter by all those who look upon the class struggle as the essence of socialism. Uh, moreover, Sidney Webb enjoys a reputation for competence that is much exaggerated. He has had the merit of wading through uninteresting documents and has had the patience to produce one of the most extremely indigestible compilations on the history of trade unionism that exists but he has a mind of the narrowest description which could only impress people unaccustomed to reflection. That's mean. Those people who introduced his fame into France knew nothing at all about socialism, and if he is really in the first rank of contemporary authors of economic history, as his translator affirms, it is because the intellectual level of these historians is rather low. Moreover, many examples show us that it is possible to be a most illustrious professional historian, and yet possess a mind something less than mediocre. Rather do I attach any importance to the objections made to the general strike uh, based uh, shoot, based on considerations of a practical order, to want to construct hypotheses about the nature of the struggles of the future and the means of suppressing capitalism on the model furnished by historical accounts is a return to the old methods of the utopians. There is no process by which the future can be predicted scientifically nor even one which enables us to discuss whether one hypothesis about it is better than another. Innumerable, memorable examples have shown that the greatest men have committed prodigious errors in thus desiring to make predictions about even the least distant futures. Um, these comments on the errors committed by Marx are numerous and sometimes enormous. Uh, and yet, we are unable to act without leaving the present. Um, without considering the future, which seems forever condemned to escape our reason. Experience shows that the framing of the future in some indeterminate time may, when it is done in a certain way, be very effective and have few inconveniences. This happens when it is a question of myths in which are found all the strongest inclinations of a people, of a party, or of a class, inclinations which recur to the mind with the insistence of instincts in all these circumstances of life, and which give an aspect of complete reality to the hopes of immediate action upon which the reform of the will is founded. We know that these social myths in no way prevent a man from knowing how to profit from the observations he makes in the course of his life, and form no obstacle to the pursuit of his normal occupations. The truth of this can be shown by numerous examples. The first Christians expected the return of Christ and the total ruin of the pagan world. With the inauguration of the kingdom of the saints at the end of the first generation, the catastrophe did not come to pass, but Christian thought profited so greatly from the apocalyptic myth 
that certain contemporary scholars maintain that the whole preaching of Christ referred solely to this one point. The hopes that Luther and Calvin had formed of the religious exaltation of Europe were by no means realized. Very quickly, these fathers of the Reformation seemed men of a past era. For present-day Protestants, they belong rather to the Middle Ages than to modern times. And the problems which troubled them most occupy very little place in contemporary Protestantism. Must we, for that reason, deny the immense result that came from their dreams of Christian renovation? We can readily admit that the uh, real developments of the revolution did not in any way resemble the enchanting pictures which created the enthusiasm of its first adherents. But without those pictures, would the revolution have been victorious? The myth was heavily mixed up with utopias because it had been formed by a society passionately fond of imaginative literature full of confidence in the little science and very little acquainted with the economic history of the past. What does that mean by in the little science? That's in italics. Do you know what that refers to? Okay. These utopias came to nothing, but it may be asked if the revolution was not a much more profound transformation than those dreamed of by the people who in the 18th century had invented social utopias. In her own time, Mazzini pursued what the wise men of his day called a mad chimera. But it can no longer be denied that without Mazzini, Italy would never have become a great power, and that he did more for Italian unity than Cavour and all the politicians of his school. I don't know who these people are. A knowledge of what the myths contain in the way of details. Maybe I was wrong. It doesn't mention Bergson here. A knowledge of what the myths contain in the way of details, which will actually form part of the history of the future, is then of small importance. They are not astrological almanacs. It is even possible that nothing which they contain will come to pass, as was the case with the catastrophe expected by the first Christians. In our own daily life, are we not familiar with the fact that what actually happens is very different from our preconceived notion of it? And that does not prevent us from continuing to make resolutions. Psychologists say that there is heterogeneity between the ends in view and the ends actually realized. The slightest experience of life reveals this law to us, which Spencer transferred into nature in order to arrive at his theory of the multiplication of effects. Um, then there's a footnote here. I believe more... this text is absolutely filled with too many references. I know to, to even come away with something even discernible to what he's talking about without putting our own spin on it and without adding our own version of our own morality. Well, like it's, it's not even yeah. possible. Well, I suspect that's why it's not really widely read is because it's so like entrenched in its time and so like intertwined with stuff that's just died. That's just no longer the, relevant. The only thing I can think of the like little science would be like magic. <sighs> because that's a yeah. phrase I'm aware of in literature. Or maybe like... But, Maybe like practical, um, practical wisdom or something. I don't know. No. Mm -hmm. I, mm. Uh, anyways, um, there's a quote here. I've tried to show how this, uh, sorry, I believe moreover that the whole of Spencer's evolutionism is to be explained as an application of the most commonplace psychology to physics. Um, uh, duh, duh, duh. Okay, that's that's all I had to say there. I don't I don't know what that means. It doesn't elaborate. A knowledge of what the myths contain in the way of details, uh, which will actually form part of the history of the future, is then of small importance. Sorry, I read that. Um, myths must be judged as a means of acting on the present. All discussion of the method of applying them as future history is devoid of sense. It is the myth in its entirety which is alone important. Its parts are only of interest in so far as they bring out the main idea. No useful purpose is served. I think this is actually kind of uh, sort of confirming my initial read on what he kind of meant by... I, I'm going to assume it's going to confirm anything you want. Well, that's that's a dick move. Um, I mean, it's just accurate. <laughs> like, there's yeah, no yeah. way to make yeah. a grasp of, like, yeah. what he's doing here. His, uh, it's not... It's, 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 there's, there's a ton of, like, really hyper-specific polemics against contemporaries that are not remembered. And there, it, he is not getting to the point no well again he's talking about grand narratives he's yeah. talking about the mythology and how myth does mm -hmm. push us forward and make us work and and encourage that um but it, it's like he's he's it's very tough to go okay so what is his actual critique here i i, I don't have nearly the background to be able to 
scratch. Well, I think I, just judging by like his initial invocation of Bergson, like I think what he's basically doing is he's saying that like the um, the the spirit of the successful or the real revolution or something is not like a top down plan where you have like revolutionary scientists or whatever who have like set a course of like policy decisions that will lead society into that. It's it's a mythos which is like a a kind of social picture that people partake in. And so that that language is kind of like it's 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 lending to a specific use of sort of Bergsonian terms that kind of that kind of seem to fit. Like he might be he might be cheating a little bit and just using the fact that we talk about myth typically in terms of like pictures and whatnot to kind of like say, well look, like uh like you, you, you use myths to gr to embed subjects into like some kind of common cause or project or whatever, and this is just this is just like what Bergson talks about how like your sense of self is the is a situation inside a an ensemble of of images or pictures or whatever, and it's just that recognizing like there's more to it than that. I'm only like a third of the way through, but uh, that seems to be kind of the move. That's that's what it looks like to me, anyways. Otherwise, I have no idea what he's talking about. It's just easier to say as I have no idea what this guy's talking about. <sighs> no useful purpose is served, therefore, in arguing about the incidents which may occur in the course of the social war and about the decisive conflicts which may give victory to the proletariat. Yeah, but I think that's what he's saying, though, because the flip side of this is he's critiquing people who are, like, trying to plan, right? It's like it's like the the sort of static image, which is a property of the the class that's struggling versus, like, a like like a course that you sort of laid out. Anyways, even supposing the revolutionaries to have been wholly and entirely deluded in setting up this imaginary picture of the general strike, this picture may yet have been, in the course of the preparation of the revolution, a great element of strength if it had embraced all the aspirations of socialism and if it had given to the whole body of revolutionary thought a, preci a precision and a rigidity which no other method of thought could have given. To estimate, then, the significance of the idea of the general strike, all the methods of discussion which are current among politicians, sociologists, or people with pretensions to practical science must be abandoned. Everything which its opponents endeavor to establish may be conceded to them without reducing in any way the value of the thesis which they think they have refuted. It matters little whether the general strike is a partial reality or simply a product of the popular imagination. All that is necessary to know is whether the general strike contains everything that socialist doctrine expects of the revolutionary proletariat. <sighs> to solve this question, we are no longer compelled to argue learnedly about the future. We are not obliged to indulge in lofty reflections about philosophy, history, or economics. We are not in the domain of ideologies. But we can remain on the level of observable... I think that directly contradicts what he was just saying, though. I don't, I don't, I think we're really I'm deeply... I'm not weighing in. No? Okay. All not right. on that. I, I, again, I, I don't think I have the ability to really go with... The, the critique is I'm reading it, and again, it's, again, I'm partial to this, so I'm really hesitant to say that's what he's doing, but it's the idea that uh, we necessarily need the myth of the general strike, and its mythology is what will drive us towards... Uh, ultimately teaching people what is necessary for people to be a proletariat and a revolutionary. It doesn't matter if it becomes real. It has no, it doesn't matter if its potentiality is actual or if it's slight, it just matters that we push it because all that matters is that things move forward and the myth pushes things forward. I have a lot of issues with this stance, but I get it. Well, it seems like, like it, it's, it seems kind of intrinsically circular because to, to the the value of pushing forward in that way is sort of presuming the thing that you you think it's going to push forward to. Like no, it's, no, no, I no. That's actually his point. Is it? Um, oh, it, now if, we're weighing in. Sorry, go on. Oh no, no, but that's his that's his underlying critique that he's saying. Like all these people are saying, oh look, a general strike. It doesn't. It won't happen. Or what the idea of it is, or what it looks like. And it's like, yeah. um if we were to say on the fascist side of things a the libertarian free society for all of us to you know like every libertarian wants to hire our own security and fuck kids right they they all aim towards it now whether or not they're all actively doing that they're not 
but their daily activities in line with that. It gives them a mythos that they can align themselves and the imagery of themselves with that will encourage or become uh, more of a libertarian or someone who pushes that direction. His argument here would be the same is true of the general strike, that if we push the idea of the general strike out, its mythology enables people to uh, to align themselves with it because it is you know, worker first, anti-capitalist. Right. Like, it just gives you those, those top-line things. And that seems to be what, as I'm reading this, this is what he's uh, pushing, is it uh, no useful purpose is served in arguing about the incidents, which may occur in the course of the social war and about the decisive conflicts which may give victory to the proletariat. Even supposing the revolutionaries to have been wholly and entirely deluded in setting up this imaginary picture of a general strike, this picture may yet have been, in the course of the preparation of the revolution, a great element of strength if it had embraced all the aspirations of socialism and if it had given to the whole body of revolutionary thought a precision and rigidity which no other method of thought could be given. It's a power of myth. Uh, for people. I have a lot of issues with this, but that's what I'm reading that he's saying. So it's kind of like, so like the, the point isn't so much that he's sort of like presuming the positive, the specific positive outcome of the general strike. He's just saying that it's valuable to keep the myth of it because it will, it serves as something to propel people sort of beyond, I guess, like the, the event horizon of like capitalist society or something. Yeah. If you think of, um, I mean, it's, it's basically as childish as the idea that was popular in like the 2000s of the, the film pay it forward. And all you have to do is pay it forward. Do something nice for the next guy. I'll make the world a better place. Yeah. Like that mentality of the individualized atomized actions that are in line with a grand idea will drive more of the world you want to see um, without having to necessarily break down all of the rules of what exactly a general strike is. Does it work here? What does this thing look like? Does it matter that you can just push forward? Um, and that's the, I mean, that's how I'm reading it. Again, I have a lot of issues with yeah, this. Yeah. Um, and we're getting back into Bergson by the look of it. To solve this question, we're no longer compelled to, uh, argue learnedly about the future. We are not obliged to indulge in lofty reflections about philosophy, history, or economics. We are not in the domain of ideologies, but we can remain on the level of observable facts. We have to question, I, I don't, I don't like that line because that seems to, I, I just doesn't fit. I don't like a lot of this. I like ideas in it and lines in it. But okay, I but I like, I like that one less. We have to question men who take a very active part in the real revolutionary movement among the proletariat who do not aspire to climb into the bourgeoisie and whose mind is not dominated by corporative prejudices. These men may be deceived about an infinite number of political, economic, or moral questions, but their testimony is decisive, sovereign, and irrefutable when it is a question of knowing what are the ideas which most power, which most powerfully move them and their comrades, which most appeal to them as being identical with their socialist conceptions and thanks to which their reason, their hopes, and their way of looking at particular facts seem to make but one indivisible unity. And this apparently... Don't, 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 I, I'm too stupid. I'm just going to say I'm stupid and just move on. Okay, well, I'm apparently just erasing that sentence from this because my... my Oh, my, my, uh, Adobe is bugging out. Um, but hey, apparently it's another application of Bergson's theories. I don't, it would be nice if you like told us which theory, <laughs> like, <laughs> or, or, or how it's an application of it, because it's the idea that you end up with a unified subject is kind of yes. With, uh, I, I'd have to find out what's going on there. Apparently he goes into it a lot in uh, that Aristotle and Marx book, but I can't find an English translation of it. Thanks to these men, we know that the general strike is indeed what I have said. The myth in which socialism is wholly comprised, i.e. a body of images capable of evoking instinctively all the sentiments which correspond to the different manifestations of the war undertaken by socialism against modern society. Strikes have engendered in the proletariat the noblest, the deepest, and the most moving sentiments that they possess. The general strike groups them all in a coordinated picture, and by bringing them together, gives to each one of them its maximum intensity, appealing to their painful memories of particular conflicts. It colors with an intense life all the details of the composition presented to consciousness. We thus obtain that intuition of socialism, which language cannot give us with perfect clearness, and we obtain it as a whole perceived instantaneously this is the global image of bergson's philosophy 
sorry, this is the global knowledge, pardon me, of Bergson's philosophy. Um, this is a this is a sentence. This is it accurate? I, I don't know. Is it accurate? No, 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 no. That's that's accurate. I mean, the sentence is accurate. The um, language is unable to give us perfect clarity. If I say, for example, hey, there's a flower over there. Yeah. I guess there's a million possibilities of what that could be. Like language can't communicate that perfectly. But if I if I'm saying, well, pointing at the finger and you look at it, there's there there's um. There is a direct and total knowledge that is from intuition and the way that intuition is set up um, that Bergson saw as being sort of super, super powerful. It's a really interesting way to phrase it. I'm, I'm going to, I am slowly feeling like I don't know Bergson at all though. So it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> well, like, Here's a here's here's a sentence. It's a lot. There's a lot, man. Here here's a sentence, and just and more. I'm, I'm critiquing Sorel for like not explaining any of this, just kind of waving at it. Um, it would be it would be weird if he was doing with sort of like Bergson's language exactly what he was accusing uh, the the uh, what do the, like the parliamentary socialists so on and so forth above of doing with Marxist language. Because I'm not, I'm not getting anything from the inclusion of these terms. Like it doesn't, it doesn't clarify anything. It's. I it's, mean, it's the line he says: the uh, the myth in which socialism is wholly compromised, i.e., a body of comprised, i.e., a body of images capable of evoking instinctively all the sentiments which correspond to the different manifestations of the war undertaken by socialism against modern society. But the, the phrasing there is he believes the image, uh, the myth of the general strike imparts all of the knowledge necessary for people to be, I, which I wholly disagree with in like about a thousand ways. Uh -huh. I like the sentiment, um, but it doesn't work like that. Um, he's basically saying, hey, uh, the general strike should be what we aim at and we won't, we may not get there. Getting there is not the point. It's more just the ability for that to be unifying. Um it's not. We may urge yet another piece of evidence to prove the power of the idea of the general. I mean, strike. Like, like let's critique it. Let's just sure. I, like I, I just think it's worth like. Okay. If we're talking about a general strike, who yeah. is that? Who is a proletariat? And tell me how they exist in our society today. And I will give. I will get a thousand answers from this. Is it yeah. the guy working at Best Buy? Sure. Is it the manager at Best Buy? N no. Yes. Yes. No. Depending on who you talk to. Is it the guy on the corner who owns or rents a franchise from McDonald's and it's what he does a hundred hours a week? Is it like, where, where's the line for the proletariat and the general strike? And how is that set up given the capitalist control so much of everything? And there's such a tiny number of them that actually exist. Where is this? How about people who own four or five houses, landlords. Sure, we can say they're not proletariats. How about if a guy who's a plumber saves up and buys another one or buys a second house and rents that out? Is he a proletariat or a landlord scum? You tell me, like, the the image of these things, and if you actually go talk to people, this doesn't convey, convey to anyone what a proletariat is meaningfully in any sense of the word. It did maybe a hundred fucking years ago when we had basically very clean lines, but bourgeois proletariats in the West is a completely almost meaningless distinction at this point. Well, it seems like what he's actually taking shots at, because this is like this, this idea of like the general strike versus the Vanguard party or something like that's, that's the old, um, Lenin, um, Luxembourg debate. And I think what's I think what's kind of going on here is the issue isn't so much who is a proletariat for him. The issue is like assuming we know that, assuming we know who the proletariat are, what do you do with them? Um, is this a thing that a an intellectual and an educated leader needs to direct from the head, or is this a thing that needs to be engaged with? Uh, sort of like in, in the Luxembourg idea of like it's not just a student that you teach, but it's a student that you teach and then allow to kind of teach you back where it's like your, your job is to 
give them the tools to spontaneously do it themselves versus the Lenin approach, which is keep them all in line. Don't let them ask questions because they don't know better and it'll inf upwardly infect um, like the, the people who are in charge of, of leading the dumb masses with concerns that are of a lower order than the revolution itself, something like that. I think that's that's kind of where he's going with this. So he's he's using the language of like uh, myth and, and image and stuff like that to give sort of the idea of a mechanism by which a... a, a the United a, Left could emerge. Or like a, specifically a headless United Left could emerge victorious or something. No, which, which is... I mean, I, I think it's irrelevant sure. in today's conversation almost wholly. I the the very idea of saying that this is the the myth we agree with. I, I have issues with myth. They lead to fascism almost as a thing, almost as if they're built that way. Um, so I have issues with that. I have issues with myth uh, being able to sort of automatically sort out people, which is what he's implying very heavily, which I think is horrifying almost as a thing. Uh, just to say that he is implying that, that, Hey, look, they'll figure out who's what and who sits. It's like, really, really? They will. You think so? Like, I just think the idea of the myth. And then I, I think of like, um, um, cause this is a uh, reflections on violence. Another great book on violence from someone I normally don't super agree with, but, uh, Hannah Arendt wrote a lot on violence and I believe she targeted just this very issue. <laughs> And talked about it like, hey, look, you have this myth. Uh, it it will turn violent. Well, I think her what her specific uh, what her specific reply was, and like she she took she took uh, aim at some pretty bad examples. But um, her her main thing was to distinguish between violence and power, and insofar as let's say the the revolutionary body whatever whatever that is comprised of is ultimately seeking to um attain like the kind of spontaneous human freedom that supposedly is like robbed from them under capitalist conditions or something like that um but but the the brunt of her book focuses on how the voice uh persuasion uh the loudness the the rhetoric at the top of the line like the the power of, yeah. of persuasion right like and, and again a general strike is just not taking part in it which again i i've i have i've had very good arguments paid you know put in in the way of that one of my favorites is actually going to be um the big fuzzy bear uh schlavoy who who does uh, an entire piece on sort of that in multiple books i think actually on the idea of just people not taking part in society anymore and how that's violence in and of itself and really encourages that kind of thing. I like this, but again, that thing is uh, problematic as a myth, as a self-separator, as a thing that people are able to, as he believes, just, it comes with these images. And I mean, no one could be mistaken with that, could they? And it's like, yeah, 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 dude, 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 yeah. She, uh, she directly actually comments on section two that we're coming towards. We're not gonna cover it here. Um, but I probably, uh, Arendt does. So I'm just going to read oh. that quickly because that might actually be sort of revealing. Um, Sorel, inspired by Bergson's Elan Vital, aimed at a philosophy of creativity. Well, that's not true either. God damn it. Sorry. So it's the one thing I, I read that he said is he, he, he didn't agree with the Elan Vital. Like that's literally like the the power inspired, of life. Inspired, inspired. So no, he says it's the thing he didn't like of Bergson's. Like he says it out. He says it like, apparently like two or three well, times. Maybe maybe course. maybe he hated it so much it like it, it triggered a creative rush or something. Jesus. No. Anyways, so Sorel, not inspired by Bergson's Elan Vital, aimed at a philosophy of creativity designed for quote unquote producers, and polemically directed against the consumer society and its intellectuals. Both groups, he felt, were parasites. The image of the bourgeois, peaceful, complacent, hypocritical, bent on pleasure, without will to power, a late product of capitalism rather than its representative, and the image of the intellectual, whose theories are constructions, quote-unquote, instead of expressions of the will. Are hopefully counterbalanced in his work by the image of the worker. Sorel sees the worker as the producer who will create the new moral qualities 
which are necessary to improve production, destroy the parliaments, which are as packed as shareholders' meetings, and opposed to the image of progress, the image of total catastrophe, when a kind of irresistible wave will pass over the old civilization. The new values turn out to be not very new. They are a sense of honor, desire for fame and glory, the spirit of fighting without hatred and without the spirit of revenge, and indifference to material advantages. Still, they are indeed the very virtues that were conspicuously absent from bourgeois society. Social war. It's not very much left of this. Social war, by making an appeal to the honor which develops so naturally in all organized armies, can eliminate those evil feelings against which morality would remain powerless. If this were the only reason, this reason alone would, it seems to me, be decisive in favor of the apologists for violence. Um, that's a Sorel quote, so one quote. Much can be learned from Sorel about the motives that prompt men to glorify violence in the abstract, and even more from his more gifted Italian contemporary, also of French formation, Vilfredo Pareto. Fanon, who had an infinitely greater intimacy with the practice of violence than either, was greatly influenced by Sorel and used his categories even when his own experience spoke clearly against them. The decisive experience that persuaded Sorel as well as Pareto to stress the factor of violence in revolutions was the Dreyfus affair in France, when, in the words of Pareto, they were, quote, amazed to see the Dreyfusards employing against their opponents the uh, same villainous methods that they had themselves denounced, unquote. And now it just moves into Pareto. Sorry, I'm not talking about Sorel anymore. Yeah. 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 Where, did you, where did you read that he didn't like the Alain Vital idea? Cause like, oh, I'll find it. Because wouldn't that... I, I feel like... I feel like that's probably more... Um, more consonant with the way in which he's kind of anthropomorphizing the... the general strike as like something that sort of has like the same... I guess image properties or whatever of... Uh, of a human subject in Bergson. Because, like... So, like, here, so... Um... This is uh, Bergson's Matter and Memory. I can see clearly how my body comes to occupy within this aggregate a privileged position. Um referring to the external world. And I understand also whence arises the notion of interiority and exteriority, which is to begin with merely the distinction between my body and other bodies. For if you start from my body, as is usually done, you will never make me understand how impressions received on the surface of my body, impressions which concern that body alone, are able to come to become for me independent objects and form an external world. But if on the contrary, all images are posited at the outset, my body will necessarily end by standing out in the midst of them as a distinct thing, since they change unceasingly, and it does not vary. The distinction between the inside and the outside will then be only a distinction between the part and the whole. There is first of all the aggregate of images, and then in this aggregate there are centers of action from which the interesting images appear to be reflected. Thus perceptions are born and actions made ready. My body is that which stands out as the center of these perceptions. My personality is the being to which these actions must be referred. The whole subject becomes clear if we travel thus from the periphery to the center as the child does, and as we ourselves are invited to do by immediate experience and by common sense. On the contrary, everything becomes obscure. I'm reading a matter in memory, by the way, for people who didn't catch that, um, by Bergson. Uh, on the contrary, everything becomes obscure and problems are multiplied on all sides if we attempt with the theorists to travel from the center to the periphery. Whence arises then this idea of an external world constructed uh, artificially piece by piece out of an unextended sensations, out of unextended sensations, though we can neither understand how they come to form an extended surface nor how they are subsequently projected outside our body. Um... Yeah, so like it, it seems like he's just treating the, the the general strike itself in the same terms in which uh, Berkson is talking about that. And he's probably going to understand like spontaneity and like freedom and whatnot as precisely like just any kind of freedom from determination by an outside force. That's that which would sort of like run with more or less what you were you were arguing earlier, where it's like like the point is just to maintain the momentum to like break free from the gravity of like the the uh 
just to break free from the capture of the, the surrounding system or whatever you find yourself locked in. It's probably worth going over uh, the Dreyfus Affair, which seems to be the reason this book was written. Um, like as a thing. Uh, okay. Dreyfus is an officer in the French military, uh, was convicted of treason. Um, they had some semblance of proof that somewhere some officer was giving stuff to the enemy. And so they went for the Jew. Yeah. Uh, it was the, that's the way it worked. Uh, this drives affair, by the way, super fucked up a lot of stuff. Uh, you could even really trace back uh, what's happening in Palestine to it. Um, it really, it's, it's, it's wild. Um, and uh, Sorrel, it seems, it was just doing some reading while you were doing that. Uh, really just was a cheerleader for Dreyfus, like really just came out and was really big on, we've got to, no, no, it's, it's important. We've got to really take care of these things. And he started realizing that uh, it life and convincing people was more than just this rational side. Mm -hmm. it, they talk about this a little bit in the introduction to the book uh, that Sorrel kind of was um, uh, how to put it. Um, he was hardened by the Dreyfus affair. It changed him. He started to see that there was a lot more to why people believed what they did or did what they did. Uh, by the way, the Dreyfus, they didn't end well. We'll just say the good guys didn't come out on the other side of that one. Um, and so that sort of drive for him and the way that he sort of pushed began having him look into other things. It's what got him into, he was already into Bergson at the time, but it's really what pushed him into the sort of idea of um, you know the knowledge that's not just quantifiable but qualitative um, how these things came about what they did um, that that set up um, yeah it's a big deal um, yeah yeah he was ultimately exiled I don't know what happened to him afterwards yeah I, I mean it Zionism came out of that. Uh, the founder of Zionism, a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. It was kind of wild. Uh, and from the intro, from the uh, introduction here, uh, if Sorrel believed that Bergson greatly extended our understanding of large-scale popular modern movements, he always remained extremely doubtful about the validity of Bergson's later vitalist evolutionary theories. Interesting. So. Which is a Elon Vital. Somebody, a so, so yeah, so somebody's somebody's wrong. <laughs> I, I would go with the guys, the who guy who specializes in Sorrel. Also, would... Hannah Rent. Hannah Rent can be really interesting. She also is really fucking sloppy, like really sloppy, and she tends to narrativize. Like, she's a she's a good storyteller, which is one of the worst things about her. Um, yeah, yeah, like uh, Human Condition, really interesting book. Uh, don't don't let that be like your. Don't stop there. <laughs> oh my god. Like she's worth reading, but like, yeah. She's yeah. she's not a she's not a philosopher. Um. Okay. Last last section, last page, paragraph. Oh yay. Um, it is easy to understand the reason for this attitude. Politicians have nothing to fear from the utopias which present a deceptive... Uh, actually, no, we need to... We need to reread this paragraph here. We may urge yet another piece of evidence to prove the power of the idea of the general strike. If this idea was a pure chimera, as is so frequently said, parliamentary socialists would not attack it with such heat. I do not remember that they ever attacked the senseless hopes which the utopians have always held up before the dazzled eyes of the people. In the course of a polemic about realizable social reforms, Clemenceau uh, brought out the Machiavellianism in the attitude of Juarez when he is confronted with popular illusions. He shelters his conscience between some cleverly balanced sentence, balanced sentence, but one so cleverly balanced that it, quote, will be received without thinking by those who have the greatest need to probe into its substance while they will drink in with delight the delusive rhetoric of terrestrial joys to come, unquote. But when it is a question of the general strike, it is quite another thing. Our politicians are no longer content with complicated reservations. They speak violently and endeavor to induce their listeners to abandon this conception. 
It is easy to understand the reason for this attitude. Politicians have nothing to fear from the utopias which present a deceptive uh, image of the future to the people and turn, quote, men towards immediate realizations of terrestrial felicity, which anyone who looks at these matters scientifically knows can only be very partially realized after long efforts, unquote. This is what socialist politicians do, according to Clemenceau. The more readily the electors believe in the magical forces of the state, the more they will be disposed to vote for the candidate who promises marvels. That's a good line. In the electoral struggle, each candidate tries to outbid the other in order that the socialist candidates may put the radicals to rout. The electors must be credulous enough to believe every promise for the future. Our socialist politicians, therefore, take very good care not to combat these comfortable utopias in any very effective way. If they struggle against a general strike... Sorry, were you going to say something? Nope. Okay, I heard a sound. If they struggle against a general strike, it is because they recognize in the course of their propaganda tours that the idea of the general strike is so well adapted to the working class soul that there is the possibility of its dominating the latter in the most absolute manner and of leaving no place for the desires which the parliamentarians are able to satisfy. They perceive that this idea is so effective as a mode of force that once it has entered into the minds of the people, they can no longer be controlled by leaders, and thus that the power of the deputies would be reduced to nothing. In short, they feel in a vague way that the whole socialist movement might easily be absorbed by the general strike, which would render useless all the compromises between political groups, in view of which the parliamentary regime has been built up. The opposition of the official socialists therefore furnishes a confirmation of our first inquiry into the significance of the general strike. <sighs> there, all right. Um, that's that. For now. Any for your thoughts? You're mute, by the way. Sorry. Why'd you read this? Uh, I read this because a patron uh, wanted me to do some content on it, and because my video essays take forever to come out, I now do a stream on the subject matter as a freebie before. Are I... you doing a? You're doing a bigger thing on this? I'll be responding to it in some way. I'm not going to approve I wish it necessarily. You all the luck. Why? Thank you. Um, this I mean, it's, it's it's extremely outdated socialist thinking. I'll, uh, what I'm probably going to do is like more talk. I, I'm guessing I'm going to end up talking about it more than I'm going to be kind of using it as like the basis of something. That's kind of my that's kind of my assumption. The uh, the person who recommended it has just started reading it and just was finding it interesting. So that was the that was the basis. So yeah, I'm 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 picking up a copy. Of, there's a Sorrel actually has a larger piece that he wrote about Bergson. That's in a. If anyone can find uh, the Socialist Movement magazine, uh, Le l'évolution, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the Le Mouvement Socialiste. Uh, it's an old magazine. I can't find a digital version of. Uh, um, volume 22 uh which is specifically what he uh wrote a larger piece on bergson on i'd really love to read that damn thing i'd rather not spend 25 bucks a lot of it is reprint i'm gonna have to do it it's very frustrating to buy reprints i hate that shit my weakness is all of this is in french very little of it seems to have actually been translated it seems uh, like this is one of the few things french is not hard and also there's like a million AI slash translation programs that you just dump the fucker into and just generally it's fine. It's as good as a lot of these fucking things that you're going to read otherwise. <sighs> that feels wrong though. Why? I don't know. It just does. Um, I mean, it helps to know French. The reason I learned French is so I could have it literally side by side and be able to go, well, that's an interesting interpretation of that line. Why are they saying this? Um, it helps to know because a lot of this stuff is very minor. Uh, for example, um, I've been going through and having this larger sort of argument with people about uh, Deleuze and, and Guattari's uh, What is Philosophy, where they talk about scientists. And they use the term scientists a lot. Um, 
as an American, scientists um, is dudes in lab coats. Like it's it's uh, maybe extends to mathematics, but it's like the most extreme hard scientists sciences. This is how I hear the word scientist. I don't know about you. Is that about right? Yep. So if I said, no, actually, it's about anyone within sort of academics uh -huh. who deals with a studied uh, professorial or or academic style thing, which could be the soft sciences, could be anything, then that's not what a scientist is. Right. <laughs> that's, that's a... Um, and so I'm like, that's a weird that they're using that because it's this discipline thing where they're really lining. Well, it turns out they don't do that in the original. The original, they actually have a, a they use the word a savant, uh, which probably doesn't work too well in English these days. But a doctor, a savant uh, means um, uh, academic, basically, professor. Um, someone in, who's got an exceptionally large amount of knowledge in a thing. Um, filled with trivia, filled with facts, filled with that. That's not what a scientist is, and it's an odd change, but that minor stuff is extraordinarily kind of wild when you start getting into these things. So it helps. helps to learn French or whatever language your original shit is in, for sure. I'm um, not finding it's just these fucking shitty reprints for like 30 bucks or 20 bucks. It's just, God damn it, people. There's no original... Like, I, if I'm going to spend 50 bucks on a thing, I'm curious how much an original would be. One moment. Frustrating. So, yeah. Uh, it helps to know French. But just dive in. You'll learn it eventually. French is not that hard of a language. I asked a, a guy who... Um, he studied under, uh, under like he actually went and studied under Deleuze, the old, older guy, and a uh, wonderful guy, Terrence Blake, if you ever get a chance, uh, Agent Swarm is his blog. Oh, amazing. He's a bit curmudgeonly, but I kind of like the guy a lot. Um, very learned in it. And um, there's a sort of line that he had when I was first like debating on learning French and goes, look, learn it. You'll be able to read it very quick. It doesn't take a lot but you won't be able to order food to save your life. And he's right. So, so it's shocking how little you can, like it's easier to read. It's shockingly easy to read because it has a lot of similar structures as English um, and a lot of our words are from it. So it's a romantic language, it's not hard.